Hello, this is ECG case number nine from Paramedicine 101. If you're not following along with these ECG cases, you could always just look on here and pause it, look at the EKG and see what you, you think is going on. But if you want to get involved in, this, in the uh, discussion, go to paramedicine101.com or uh, on Facebook, search for Paramedicine 101 and you definitely can uh, see a whole lot of good information, including the, uh, you know, the cases that I provide pretty often. So here's the scenario for this case. You respond to a nursing home. It's a 65-year-old female. She tells you she has left arm pain. Uh, she looks pale, cool, and clammy. You know, she looks a little shocky. And she tells you she has exertional dyspnea. So every time she does something, she gets very short of breath. So we know that this might be cardiac. I mean, this should be screaming cardiac or check a 12 lead or, you know, that uh, these postmenopausal, you know, elderly females, they have these atypical presentations for MI very often. So even if it's not, you know, just a, a chest pain call, you got to think that these types of symptoms, especially uh, with the elderly female or with a diabetic, these definitely can be cardiac calls. So you got to get a 12 lead. And here's the 12 lead uh, that I actually posted. I know there's a lot of artifact on this 12 lead, and that's kind of why I posted it. Actually, the next one we have is a little bit cleaner, uh, but this one kind of had some, some changes on it that I wanted to point out. First off, it is artifact. There's no atrial flutter. I, I, somebody did say a flutter or a fib. That's not a fibrillatory wave. That's just baseline artifact. If you notice, it's most prominent in the limb leads, probably because she's moving her arms a little bit or her legs. Um, and you'll see that it kind of clears up as you look throughout the precordial leads. And you can still kind of see some stuff with the CKG. So that's why I posted it. I wanted to see what you guys thought. So let's let's dissect it a little bit. Let's take a look and see see what we got. Um, first off, the rate's 88. It seems regular. If you map it out, it seems pretty regular. Okay, so it can't be AFib. And the rhythm appears to be sinus. Uh, from what we could tell, the, the, there's P waves with every QRS complex. There's no dropped beats. It's a, it's a good regular rate. And the P waves are all upright in the leads, that, or they appear upright in all the leads that they should be. And I think that they're negative here in AVR. It kind of looks like they're down there. If you take a, a look, this looks like, let's see if I can put a good arrow on it. That looks like the P wave right there. It's negative. So let's look further at this 12 lead and look for any mimics, any ST changes, uh, any problems with our intervals. The PR interval looks about right in 129. That's over here. Okay. The QRS duration looks narrow. That's good. 93. Uh, the QTC is 440. 440, it's starting to get a little bit longer, okay? 460 is generally uh, the longest QTC interval that you should see normally, um, and that's pretty long. I mean, in females, they're a little bit longer than in males, and 460 tends to be that peak number. Now, when you get a great greater than 500, that's kind of when you're gonna start worrying about arrhythmias like torsades or something like that. So there's things we know that can prolong the QTC. Anterior wall MI is one of those things. Um, and it, it kind of helps you with your differential uh, when you're trying to differentiate early repolarization or anterior wall MI. The QTC might be something that you look at. We talked about that in uh, just the previous ECG case. All right, uh, and your QRS axis, it says 248. Do you think that's right? 248 uh, would be in that no man's land. Okay, so let, we have to look at this and see if that, that's right. And if you just do the quick quadrant method, you'll see that lead one is mostly positive and AVF is mostly positive. So it cannot be an axis of 248. Let's get rid of that. The reason it's giving you that is because of the artifact. Um, it, you know, probably thought the R wave was, was a little bit taller than it actually is in AVR. Um, so it probably thought you had that, that north, uh, west axis that we call no man's land or extreme right axis deviation. You generally only see that with uh, pacer uh, patients that have uh, implanted pacers or ventricular arrhythmias or maybe like dextrocardia or some electrolyte imbalance or something like that. So looking further at this 12 lead, um, what I find uh, to be, you know, the thing that stands out and worries me the most are these T waves over here. Okay, whenever you see a T wave that looks pretty symmetrical, Okay, if you draw a line down, that's not the middle. If you drew a line down the middle of that T wave, it's going to be hard for me to do with this pen. I'm going to keep trying. If you drew a line down, there you go, down the middle, you'd see that it's kind of uh, the same 
on both sides. It looks like it mirrors each other on this side and on that side of the T wave. And that's never normal. That's always a sign of some sort of pathology. And one of those pathologies that it could be would be an early uh, myocardial infarction. Okay, one of the things we get is something called a hyperacute T wave. And the, the manifestation is a symmetrical T wave. It's pretty tall, okay, for it to be hyperacute. And it's got a broad base generally. It's, it's got a wide bottom, okay? Unlike a hyperkalemic T wave, that's usually pretty narrow until it becomes a sine wave or something like that. Um, so that's, that looks a little bit hyperacute to me. And along with something that is not normal, the J point's actually depressed here in V2. Now, when you have this, this T wave discordance where the last wave of the QRS complex is negative and the T wave is positive, you should see maybe an isoelectric uh, J point or maybe a little bit elevated. That's why we generally would like to see more than two millimeters of ST elevation in these discordant leads like V2 or V3 before calling a STEMI. But here we see that the ST segment's almost depressed in V2 and in V3. And generally that's something called uh, De Winter's T waves. De Winter's T waves. It's something that uh, it's fairly new to me. I've only heard it within the past year or so. And I've heard uh, Tom Boothelay from EMS12E.com talk about it. I've heard Dr. Amal Matu talk about it. And now I'm hearing uh, Dr. Stephen Smith talking about it, who are, you know, the three EKG uh, gurus that I, I look at a whole lot. And th this the Winter's T-Wave presentation is actually an early sign of an anterior wall MI, or even more precisely, a LED occlusion, which causes this anterior wall MI. Okay, and, and the reason being it's in these leads, V2, V3, uh, maybe a little bit in V4. Okay, so let's look at that cleaner EKG I told you that they got. It, a little bit cleaner, there's still some artifact here. Um, this one, the J point depression may not be as evident in V2. It's still there, maybe a little like more isoelectric there, but you can still see it in V3 and in V4. Um, typically, just seeing that J point depression might not be too concerning. But with the symmetrical, broad based, kind of tall T waves, you got to think acute, you know, ischemia, acute, early acute myocardial infarction. The monitor says acute ischemia here. This patient was treated as a STEMI uh, because the medics were concerned when they saw it said acute ischemia here. And, you know, maybe they saw something else. They called it a STEMI because they, they don't see any ST elevation, but they did call it a STEMI. And the patient did go up to the cath lab. They ended up having a uh, almost completely occluded uh, left anterior descending coronary artery. So they were they received stents and, and fared pretty well. So I just wanted to point this out because it is a kind of an important thing. You don't want to overlook stuff like this. And it, it's kind of a minimal finding in, in the respect that it's not doesn't stand out like your tombstones would stand out or like a you know broad you know ST elevation everywhere across the 12 lead. It doesn't do that. You know, it's just these symmetrical kind of tall T waves maybe a little bit of J-point depression where, they, where it doesn't belong. That's why you gotta look at as many 12 leads as possible. I mean, that's really how you learn this stuff is just repetition, keep looking at 12 leads. The more 12 leads you look at, the more you'll notice patterns like this. I mean, I can't tell you how many inferior wall MIs I've seen uh, and the, the, the pattern just stands out. And when it doesn't fit the pattern, that also stands out to me. So. Just keep looking at 12 leads. Go on ems12lead.com. Uh, Dr. Stephen Smith's EKG blog is also good. Watch these videos as much as possible. If you haven't watched my previous EKG cases, check them out because I think they're pretty good, but uh, I might be a little biased. So here's, um, remember I said Dr. Stephen Smith was talking about the winner's T-waves. This was a 12 lead that he posted. Uh, and and it, most prominent in V4, V5, maybe a little bit in V6, you see the ST depression, okay? And you see these symmetrical, tall, broad-based T waves, uh, which are never normal. The T waves like this are never, ever, ever normal. That doesn't mean that it's an MI, but you've got to think that there's some sort of uh, pathology causing this condition. Okay, so that's your take-home point. Symmetrical, broad-based T waves, they could be hyperacute, they're, and they're usually pretty tall. Uh, and hyperacute T waves uh, could be an indication of an early myocardial infarction. And then the winner's T waves are when you see that hyperacute T wave with ST depression or J point depression. Okay. And it's something that might help one of your future patients. So, you know, watch this video a couple times till you commit it to memory. If you've got any interesting EKG cases or if there's anything you want to hear about, any questions, 
feel free to email me at paramedicine101 at gmail.com. Again, my name is Adam Thompson. I have no problem uh, answering your questions. I love getting EKGs and checking them out. And until we get to the next one, I hope you have a good, happy holidays, and I'll see you then. Take care.